She is back a second time on the podcast and she has written a new book. She has released The Ones of Future Sex, Growing and Evil, A Woman's Role in Society, which I highly recommend. And I, like I said, we tweeted about it. It's not long enough, in my opinion. <laughs> the last time we were, we were here, we talked about misconceptions in the medieval era. But this time, we're going to talk about sex in the medieval era and sexuality. And... I highly recommend checking out the last one as episode as well. It got over 10,000 views and it's the most watched episode in the podcast, which I think is just mind blowing. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being back. And tell us how did this book came about in the first place. Mm, yeah, so this book is really kind of my baby in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I, I first began looking into uh, gender and sexuality while I was doing my PhD. Um, although my PhD was not really about uh, women at all whatsoever. Uh, my PhD was about Prague. And um, I was writing about uh, the court of Ch Emperor Charles IV and preaching as a form of propaganda that offset that. And uh, the preacher that I worked on, um, Jan Milch of Fremergis, he was um, a big one for trying to um, rescue or rehabilitate sex workers. Um, and this was like a big thing for him was paying off the debts that sex workers had. And then, you know, they could either then live in, he, he had like a weird quasi-religious house, um, or they could go do whatever it is they wanted in theory. Um, and so I had to start learning a lot about sex work. Um, and I was so struck by how different medieval understandings of, of sex work were and how different their relationship with it was that it kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of looking into sexuality more broadly and so I knew then when I kind of started working more with the public that this was going to be a really good thing to talk about because, you know, in terms of myth busting, which is, you know, mm. largely what I do, as we saw last time, yeah. um, you, you know, um, the, the idea that medieval people are all religious, so they're all very good, you know, and mm. they and they do exactly what the church wants them is, is super pervasive. You know, people mm. think that, well, yeah, everyone must have been on their best behavior at all times. Uh, but that's just not the case. Um, and you, you get this really interesting, varied world when you start looking into sexuality in the period. And I thought that that would be a really fun thing to talk about. Um, but then on top of that, I, the book also discusses uh, beauty stance. And uh, when work students might be, period, and so to kind of highlight the differences between the realities of medieval life um, and our expectations there. Um, so overall, it's supposed to kind of give a picture of what medieval people sort of thought about women and how they get to those ideas and how it, you know, it, these ideas are really, really different to our own. Um, but the outcome is largely the same, mm -hmm. which is interesting. You know, uh, we kind of treat women like second class citizens now. And we certainly did in the Middle Ages. But it's just that the kind of reckoning as to why mm -hmm. women are treated differently is very, very drastically different. I think that's a really important thing to talk about because people just kind of assume that it has to be this way, you know, that um, right. women women are necessarily worse than men. And so society has organized itself around that fact. Which but is, of course, ludicrous. Sit, yeah, exactly. And when you sit down and look at these justifications for why you treat women differently, we change them all the time. We change them all the time. None of it is real. You yeah. know? It's just the only thing is we just kind of like it. Mm. So um, I think it's really valuable to realize that you know they're, they're, this is all just kind of like a game we're playing mm. and I want to begin with what you write about in the book and you begin open with this as well what medieval, what medieval beauty the standard for what was considered beautiful mm. in the medieval era and we don't focus a lot of women today because that's what the book is mainly about of course mm -hmm. and we don't want to talk so much about men as well but you know with mainly women is going to be focus on this episode so let's begin mm -hmm. with because it's has high standards and it wasn't <laughs> easy to live up to so let's talk about that for to begin with yeah so i mean when we talk about the medieval beauty standard in europe there's one <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, it's it's uh, okay quite funny um you know we don't know a whole ton about the earlier medieval period because people didn't really uh, describe women in literature and you know art um, it can be highly stylized so it doesn't 
you know, really reflect what they'll be going on. You know, if, if you see a description, for example, of like a seventh century queen, they'll just say, oh, she's beautiful. And you're mm. like, what do you mean by that? Nope, that's just it. Like, you know, she's beautiful and that's all. Okay. But you get to the 12th century um, and the 12th century Renaissance and medieval people become a lot more interested in kind of creating literary concepts and artistic concepts about what beautiful is. And in order to do this, they do what medieval people always do, which is they go back to the ancient period to go look at what ancient people thought about this. And then they're kind of disappointed <laughs> because uh, uh, ancient people also don't really describe um, women. So, you know, for example, they go looking expressly for descriptions of Helen of Troy. Because, you know, she's the most beautiful possible woman. So what does she look like? And usually ancient descriptions of her just say that she's blonde and she's got white skin and she's beautiful. Mm. And that that's about it. And that's all you know about her, you know. Um, so they kind of end up making their own decisions about what they think is beautiful. And there are a couple of people in particular. It's Geoffrey of Vinsoff. Um, and Matthew of Vendôme, um, who are writing books about poetry expressly saying, this is how you write poetry. Here's a new style of poetry. And when you want to write poetry, this is how you do it. And they say, this is what a beautiful woman is. Like, just, it, just completely say that if you're going to describe a beautiful woman, you have to describe her like this. And it's a kind of top-down scan of the body. So it starts at the head and goes to the feet. And so a beautiful woman has blonde hair, a high free forehead, which is kind of like a really high hairline. So they, they like hairlines to be way, way back and, and like a lot of forehead. Um, she should have black eyebrows that are not a monobrow. There should be a space in between them and they should be arched. She should have gray eyes uh, um, and expressly gray. They just really like gray eyes. Um, white skin, uh, cheeks that are red like roses, white teeth. Uh, breath like honey and a sweet little mouth like a rose. Then she has a neck that is long and white like a swan, uh, small white shoulders, long arms and long fingers, small high breasts, uh, a thin waist, a pot belly, and a thick thighs and a big bum, long legs and small feet. And that's what a beautiful woman is, the end. Um, and this it takes off, you know, th th mm. this is just the way that beautiful women are described. Now, occasionally, if someone is writing a description of someone who is beautiful and she happens to be a brunette, they'll say, oh, oh yeah, she's got brown hair, you know, like very, very quickly. Mm. Or um, sometimes they will just omit <laughs> things that don't uh, live up to the standards. So, you know, if, you can kind of read between the lines. And if she doesn't have gray eyes, it just won't mention her eye color. Right. Mm. And so you, you kind of realize that she hasn't quite lived up to it there. But this then gets taken on in medieval art as well. So pretty much every image that you see of a beautiful woman from this period is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I paid a great deal of money <laughs> for uh, an image of um, part of the Ghent altarpiece uh, by Jan van Eyck. Um, and it shows the virgin martyrs at the end of the world, like coming to worship the, the celestial lamb of Christ. And if you look at it, every single one of them is completely interchangeable. The only reason you can tell, oh, that's St. Barbara is because she's carrying a tower. You can tell, oh, that's St. Catherine because she's got wheels on her dress. But otherwise, they are completely interchangeable blonde girls with pot bellies and small boobs and that is just what it means to be to to be a beautiful woman um so you know, there's this kind of ossified ideal of, about beauty but what i think is quite interesting that that ideal is very much easier for wealthy women to live up to mm. than peasant women so for example um wealthy women can have white skin because they're not out in the field all day plowing and you know getting sunburned uh, in a world before spf you know um wealthy women have a smaller can have smaller breasts because when they give birth to children they can give their children to a wet nurse and bind their breasts back up and then their breasts will go back to a smaller size more quickly and easily um wealthy women can have a pot belly because they can have white bread and they're not doing manual labor all day so they can kind of cultivate the extra body fat that otherwise uh, women can't have um you know Having 
delicate, long white fingers again. And, you know, well, you're clearly someone who isn't working as a dairy maid or something, you know, uh, and then kind of subjecting your hands to a lot of work all day. Oh, actually, I take that back. Dairy maids have it pretty good because their hands are in butter all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's like kind of famous. <laughs> Everyone thinks dairy maids are hot. It's it, it's very funny. Um, mm. But, but you know, this kind of thing. So, you know, if you're not feeding chickens all the time, you got pretty hands yeah. and you know you could afford nicer clothes and like the clothes always kind of accentuate this pear shape that they want women to have and you know it so there's this expressed class way of relating to beauty and of course we have that now right you know our own beauty standards are very much beholden to whatever it is that wealthy people like so for example right. now that um, most people kind of work in inside jobs. Having a tan is suddenly the thing that's beautiful, right? Because it's like, mm. oh, have you been on holiday, right? Mm. You know, or you've got enough yeah. um, free time to be out in the sun. So, wow, that's that's nice. Mm. Um, you know, we don't. Well, you know, we're we're in the process of changing our beauty ideal once again. You know, we were in this kind of like Kardashian moment yeah. where we wanted like really exaggerated hourglass figures, which you know, a surgery will do that. Mm. You know, ta-da, and like who can afford surgery? Mm. Then surgery became less expensive. Mm. And suddenly that's not good anymore. And now we're we're back to this thing about being ultra, ultra thin, uh, which mm. requires, you know, hours upon hours of exercise and a personal chef and you know mm. just not eating. Right. And a lot and a lot um, of women get was, eating disorders because because they try to keep so thin. Yeah, exactly. And it's a really interesting one because, you know, you'll see people say ridiculous things about it and they'll say, oh, well, you know, really being thin is healthy, you know, and which mm. obviously it isn't. And, you know, so, uh, of course, everyone is attracted to that. And, you know, if you told if you showed a medieval person a picture of like a fashion model now, like a super, super thin fashion model, mm. they would be like, what are you talking about? I don't think this is attractive mm. at all whatsoever. You know, like it just it's something completely different from them. And. I think that that is a really useful thing to kind of think about because it just shows us how much of a construct all these things are. These we just kind of decide what's beautiful. It, it, you know, it's a decision that we make, and surprise, surprise, that decision that we make always favors the people who have money at all times. And you know, poor women have to start really dangerous you know a way of kind of looking at things and it it leads to people really destroying their bodies and destroying their lives yeah Yeah. and something that you write about as well because we mentioned the standard of beauty and if you try to live up to that standard you were basically branded as for lack of better (laughs) words a slut it was hard yeah it It was very contradictory in the medieval era yeah, so it's it's an incredibly funny one because, so for example, the, you know, in order to achieve these things, you could wear makeup, right? Mm. So you could wear kind of like white face paint and you get these, Um, I think it's in uh, the Night of the, Tow- the Tower of Landry. He writes this kind of guide for his daughters about mm. how to be a good wife. And he's warning them off about makeup. And uh, he gives this example of a woman who was renowned for her beauty, but she'd been using makeup the whole time. And then when she dies, like her face essentially collapses in on itself because the makeup was so caustic or something. And they're like, aha, see, she wasn't really beautiful. And now she's in hell because mm. uh, u- using makeup is is considered mm. like a sin. And there's this direct... Um, link between the idea of wearing makeup being a sin and uh, the person of Jezebel, Mm. which is a really interesting one because, you know, famously, the thing about Jezebel, if you read (laughs) the Bible, is that, you know, she kills her neighbor because she wants his vineyard. Like, she's a murderer. Um, And... uh, you know, she's she's a, she kind of like gets her comeuppance where she puts on eyeliner and looks out a window, and the medieval imagination really grabs onto the fact that she put on eyeliner, and they're like, ah, you see, she's really evil because of the makeup, <laughs> which is just so incredibly funny, you know. So you see, uh, Jezebel get connected to uh, wearing makeup, and then um, also there's the apocalyptic figure of the whore of Babylon. Um, And she gets brought up all the time about people who are wearing clothes that are too fancy. Well, women who are are wearing clothes that are too fancy. So, you know, there's this real um, worry about uh, poor women wearing nice clothing uh, and kind of like impersonating women of the upper classes. 
And an interest in clothing is generally demarcated as particularly sinful, that you're, you're like the whore of Babylon. Um, you are, you, you know, you are unserious. But at the same time, you know, everybody wants you to be wearing nice clothing, right? So it's, that's my cat, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, she's upset. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the, me. Um, the, the, we, I, she just, she hates it when I podcast. She's like, why are you talking to someone that isn't me? This is ridiculous. Right. Um, she just kicked. She just kicked the door open and yelled at I'm me. I'm a shower cat. Was like that. Yeah. Um. So it, it's quite interesting because on the one hand, you're telling women that the most important thing that they can be is beautiful, which happens all the time in the medieval period, because beauty is expressly seen as a divine favor. It's uh, It shows that God loves you. It shows that you're more um, naturally aligned with the divine. So, you know, you tell women, oh, by the way, we can tell you're holy or not by whether you're beautiful. Oh, okay. But that if you dare live up to this, then, oh, you're mm. going straight to hell. Yeah. You know, and then they, they tell all these stories about how you'll be in hell and demons are torturing women in hell for plucking their eyebrows. And it, but OK, but then you told me that in order to be beautiful, I have to have high arched eyebrows. So mm. so which is it? You know, and it's this impossible mm. standard. Right. Yeah. And another the next thing you write about is, of course, bathing, which was, again, easier for the upper class than the peasant class when yeah. the availability for, for a hot baths. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, obviously everyone is kind of doing a wash down every day with, you know, soap and water and, the, you know, they just give themselves a quick scrub. But, you know, for the upper classes, you could have a whole bath every day. Mm. You know, if somebody else is like fetching and carrying water for you, then you can just sit down and have a great time all day long. Or, you know, city people, um, if they have a lot of money, they can go to a bathhouse every day if that mm -hmm. if they so choose. So things for them are a lot easier. Um, and cleanliness is very much one of the beauty standards that so you have to mm -hmm. be clean. Right. Um, and, you know, obviously, they're also not doing manual labor. Right. So they're not coming in off the fields all sweaty. Right. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just kind of sitting there. So, you know, your once weekly bath that you're kind of going to pull yourself together when you're poorer, of course, you're going to be kind of at a loss to people who have lots of free time and people to do the hard manual labor because, you know, gosh, lugging water around is is hard work. It's really, really heavy work. And it's also women work right like this is one of the jobs that is expressly for women is moving water around so you know bringing that much water into the house heating it over the fire filling up the tub and you know getting everybody in and out of the bath as quickly as possible is this whole ordeal and you know if you're doing it in front of the fire in your one room house which is what most people are doing that's going to be a lot more annoying like everything kind of has to shift in order to let that happen whereas rich people might have a whole room for bathing and they just go servants make me a bath you know mm. and life is just much much easier in, in the roman empire and i believe in, in the islamic world as well bathhouses were fashionable like public bathhouses mm. was that was that out of fashion in medieval europe at the time or was it mainly private oh, baths? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah absolutely they have bathhouses um and uh they have very famous baths as well you know so um people will go on holiday to go bathing you know there are there are famous baths in italy and there's famous ones in uh the german lands and places like this and people will go oh that's a really nice place to go have a bath you know if people have hot springs everybody knows about that and they'll go bathe um and all all cities and most towns have bathhouses as well but it's just kind of like it's sometimes it could be more like going to the spa right where because you you got to pay money to go in so right. and the, there's kind of levels of what's on off there and it's quite funny because uh, sometimes people think that oh condemnations from the church about spending too much time in bathhouses and they'll go see the the, the church wants you to be filthy mm. uh, but that's not what it's about it's that um some bathhouses double as brothels uh mm -hmm. not all of them but a fair few um and, and all You have both men and women in marrying. And so what the church is actually complaining about uh, is sex, not bathing. Uh, and mm. people get a bit confused on that one. Mm. How, explain how people can get easily confused about this. I mean, it's, well, because, I'm trying to answer itself, but you know, just... 
Yeah. yeah so if the, if the the church will condemn people and say, oh, um, you know, you are uh, you're a frivolous individual and you're sinful because you spend so much time in bathhouses. You care more about baths than about the Lord. And what they're saying there is they're not talking about bathing. They're they're talking about are you having sex with people <laughs> in 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 the bath in, in bathhouse because you know they all bathe they they all have and they all probably have private baths you know they don't go they don't go to a bathhouse because that's a realm of temptation right mm. that's where there there are a lot of you, you know there's a lot of naked people mm. frankly and so uh and it isn't really segregated um and it's kind of a known known it, you know they they are in a lot of ways like the term we would use the term bathhouse in the English speaking world to kind of indicate that uh, somewhere is a sex club. Same thing mm. <laughs> for, for medieval people. But there, so there's bathhouses and there's bathhouses. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's one of these things where people just kind of understand which is which at the time. Mm. It's kind of like how now there's massage parlors and massage parlors. Yeah. And we yeah. know, we know which one is which, right? Yeah. So next thing I want to talk about is virginity. And that was highly highly valued, mm. especially if you were medieval monarch, but what was it the same, like, if you were a virgin, that was optimal, the preferred, of course, if you were going to get married, but was it the same with the peasant population as well, in medieval era? Yeah, so it's a, a really interesting one, because here, uh, peasants have a lot of freedom. Um, so, for you pretty much need to be a virgin when you get married. Mm. And that's just that. Um, of course, there's there are plenty of cases probably where that isn't happening, and we don't really know because you know people just mm. live their lives, and there there is no real way of uh, of, of finding that out. Uh, but it is a it's a source of constant concern for families where they're really um, on the lookout and the prowl to make sure that their daughters are kind of behaving in a respectable manner. They don't have a uh, time alone with men. That they are, you know, basically, they're basically being monitored until they get married, right? Mm. Peasant women, because there's less writing on it, it just doesn't matter. You know, there there isn't this mm. kind of, you know, worry about a bloodline in the same way that mm. royalty has. And, um, I mean, sure, they've got, uh, they have property a lot of the time that gets passed down, you know, that mm. they're... And you could be a rich peasant. That's entirely within the realm of possibility. But they don't have the same kind of emphasis placed on them. And also they are much more likely to be able to uh, decide on their marriage partners as well. I, I, I want to bring you something. Yeah. 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 So it's like, you know, if, if you are fall in love with someone and you want to marry them and you're a pair of marriages, then they are to have kind of business type marriages. Mm. So, and that is one of the worries about why noble and royal women might be having sex uh, before they get married is because the, since they're just getting married for business purposes, it's like, well, mm. you might not have anything in common with this person at all yeah. whatsoever. You're just doing it out of a sense of moral duty. So you're like, well, I'm going to go have fun. Mm. Right. Um, And so it's one of these things where it's quite interesting. So the way that they talk about virginity, you know, eating women is they refer to maidenhood. And the experience of maidenhood is kind of similar to the way that we talk about teenage girls. So it's like you're, I mean, you're sexually mature, but you're not having sex. So like maidenhood is seen as um, the ideal state for women. Mm. So, for example, at the last judgment, when everyone is going to get up out of their graves and, you know, be judged by uh by I will say George Michael uh, and be judged <laughs> by, uh, by, by uh, Saint Michael the Archangel. Mm. Um, you know he they are coming out in their ideal forms, right? Mm. And their ideal form, if you're a man, is kind of like middle age, is what they mm. always say. So there's this kind of like a 30, 40 year olds. That's what they and women come out looking like they did as maidens, mm. as teenagers, and they all look like the beauty standard and whatever else. And, and to the point where you know you see, for example, um, in the Pearl poem, which is written about a uh, man looking for his his daughter dies at two, and he kind of gets a vision of heaven and sees her, and in heaven she's a maiden. So, you know, she's suddenly like uh, she's suddenly kind of like around 18 or so. Mm. And, you know, and of course, looks like the ideal beauty standard because the ideal thing to be is this is to be a maiden. So um, someone you can sexualize, but who is sexual 
actual is kind mm. of the thing and then you know it's it it, it is quite interesting. It, it reminds me a bit of the way that we talk about like young women pop stars, mm. right? Like, uh, you know, I'm old. So kind of like growing up uh, with Britney to talk about this all the time, but that, but she was doing these incredibly sexual dances. And, like, mm. and, and it was like that, you know, trying to kind of maintain those two things at once. Mm. That's sort of how medieval people feel about maidens. Mm. And I remember reading about the Robert T. Mas, the latest historian, the Robert T. Massey's work of Peter de and he mentioned about how medieval women in Russia, up until Peter de Bray's era, and perhaps later as well, but if you were the virgin when you were sent off to marriage, you were basically locked away, sent back to your dad, you were flogged, then you were locked away for life, you, you had no possible future that you could imagine if you were busted for being a virgin, if actually medieval Russia. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, I mean, it's all, it's it's really you know there are consequences mm. for you know nobles with with these things and and more but more particularly noble women. If you're a man, you can help yourself. Like mm. go have as much sex as you want. Yeah. If you're a man, they don't they don't care at all. It's you know the, the uh, emphasis is always placed on women, and you know it, part of it is just kind of a. Um, a panic about um, the bloodlines, you know, just like mm. establishing paternity, essentially. Mm. So if you're a man, you can go and have sex with whoever you want, especially if they're from the lower classes, that's absolutely fine. That's just kind of like a gimme. Mm. Uh, but women have to not have sex so that mm. they can be monitored, essentially. Mm. Was this the case about in like medieval Russia that if you were busted from not being a virgin, if you were of nobility, you were sent back and looked, looked away from you? Was it not that harsh, perhaps? I, I mean, you would you'd probably send back to your family. You probably mm. won't be, uh, and then within that, there are certain things that happen. A lot of the time, you'll get sent to a nunnery. Mm. Uh, things like that, they'll, 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 they're like, like, okay, that's it, it's the religious view. It, it, things like that. So, you know, you're you're certainly then just become this sort of burden on your family about what is it that was is kind of like the big, the big one. Yeah. Yeah. So, there was a and that's something I want to mention here. For example, for example, like we have Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry the Second, who was had numerous adulteries, for example, mm -hmm. and the Pope didn't care, but people were out to destroy Eleanor of Aquitaine because she had some a few adulteries in her life, and this, because of this, she was going absolutely to be destroyed, her reputation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it's it's quite interesting too because um also because she was really quite disliked mm. you know um e even within it they, they make up all these weird rumors about who she had affairs mm. with so you know there's rumors that she had affairs with her uncle or, or there's Saladin. rumors that she had an affair Saladin and we're like no yeah. like, that did not happen like there's absolutely no way that that happened you know um and it's quite funny because it's like yeah she just hated both of her husbands like both mm. Louis and. Henry she just didn't get on with and that's fine and you know they they are absolutely off having all the affairs that they they want but you know when she's kind of like at her court in Aquitaine living her life even though you know she's been away from these men for years you know it, it's kind of like oh well this is completely inappropriate even though you mm. know she's not divorced from Henry but they're separated mm. right you know she tried to foment a whole rebellion against him <laughs> you know and so it's like well what, what, what do you want you know but this, so there's this understanding you know, that men can have mistresses like, to the point that like a royal mistress is pretty much a, a title mm. that you can have, but women can't have that. I mean, mm. they do. There, there's certain, um, it, it's so for example, Queen Isabella, also known as the She-Wolf, very openly mm. has a has a lover. Uh, but, you know, you that's how you end up with nicknames like the She-Wolf, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> is, is by openly behaving like a man, right? Mm. Um, and it, it's quite an interesting one because you see people really loathe women for acting on their sexuality, but at the same time, it's assumed that women are massively sexual mm. and, you know, and, and are sex crazed. So there's kind of this, how does, how does that work? How do you square this circle, right? It's like, oh, well, women are definitely very, very horny and they're, they're big old sluts. Mm. And you're supposed to somehow overcome that and master that, even though everybody secretly thinks that, you know. Well, actually, not mm. even secretly. Everyone just completely thinks that, right? Mm. I mean, we talked about this last time as well, that the church wasn't very all powerful as the movies make it out to be and of historical mm. fiction, but they are very quite powerful. Mm. So how, par how powerful were they when it came to sex and sexuality between couples? Or in general. So, I mean, I think probably about as powerful 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, they, so they, they managed to set the tone of what is acceptable sexually. You know, they say they are able to say the only time that sex is acceptable is between married people who are attempting to have a baby. Uh, but they have all these other rules, right? Mm. So they have all these other rules about, you know, when it is you're not supposed to be having sex. So, like, you're not supposed to have sex during Lent. You're not supposed to have sex during Advent. You're not supposed to have sex on Sundays. You're not supposed to have sex on Wednesdays. You're not supposed to have sex on Fridays. You're not supposed to have sex when it's daylight. You're not supposed to have sex with mm. your clothes fully off. You're not supposed to have sex if you're pregnant. You're not supposed to have sex if you're on your period. You're not supposed to have sex if you're breastfeeding. Like, you know, there are all the rules about when you're not supposed to be having sex and if it were the case that everybody followed all of the church's rules about when you are not supposed to have sex no one would have been born in the month of september in the middle ages <laughs> i mean like, just did those like, it, just would, it wouldn't have happened i mean just did yeah, those so, standards I mean, clearly so, yeah. clearly yeah like, you know like there, there's just absolutely no way there's yeah, like there's absolutely no way there. And um, I think also with this, you know, you can just tell from, for example, penitential literature. So penitentials are kind of the guidebooks that priests use when they are hearing confession. Um, and they tell they tell priests, well, here's some questions you can ask. Mm. And they tell priests, um, oh, here, here are the penances that you give if they confess to these sins. And there'll be scads of sexual sins in that, you know, where it'll be mm. anything to, from like having uh, sex with members of the same sex, having sex, like cheating on your spouse, um, you know, uh, masturbating, you know, doing sodomy, which is any kind of sex that can't result in procreation, using dildo. Those, you know, uh, doing sex magic in order to try to, like, make your husband love you more, things like this. Um, and, you know, obviously no one's listening to the church because, mm. they, you know, they're kind of showing up being like, yeah, ask them about all the sex they're having because they're, mm. they're in a situation that no one's listening, right? So mm. you can get them in trouble. You can say that's very naughty. Um, you know, you should be fasting because you're you're sinful. But it's just an assumption that no one's really listening. There are people who try really hard to do this, and you especially see it. You know, for example, you'll you'll see groups of people like the married saints who will uh, who get married but then like stay virgins and things like that. And you know, obviously they're really not into it. Or um, women who join the Beguines and things like that, you know, they'll kind of stop having sex with their husbands. Famously, Marjorie Kemp stops having sex with her husband when she decides that she's kind of going for sainthood or whatever. And so there are probably people who do follow these rules, but in reality, no, nobody's listening to, to, to this at all whatsoever. And, you know, it's the church can go ahead and ask for whatever it is they want, but that doesn't mean that anyone's going to listen. I guess 69 wasn't favorable with the church. Oh, yeah, that's sodomy. That's absolutely mm. sodomy because you can't you can't get pregnant from that. Yeah, and you know you're also supposed you're supposed to not be getting too turned on during sex as well. Mm. So you know you're not supposed to make out too much. Mm. You know, like you're not, and you're not supposed to really be like fondling each other. You know, there there's limits to all these things. In in an ideal world, according to the church, you would kind of just like get in there, ejaculate, mm. and get out as quickly as possible while mm. while having no fun. Right, they're like, you better not enjoy this, mm. basically. I mean, judging by medieval standards, I'm already doomed to hell. So, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll see you there. Don't worry. Yeah. About <laughs> it. Which one? Which, which hell? Limbo. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I want, I want the Dante version. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to like. Yeah. 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 So uh, we thought you mentioned that you wrote a PhD on this, the prostitution, prostitution in the medieval era. So let's talk a little bit about, about prostitution as well. Yeah. Um. So because the the way that it works in in the Middle Ages is that it's considered absolutely necessary, uh, mm. for the functioning of society. Uh. So the idea here is that um, okay, so sex is bad and sexuality is bad, but it's something that exists as a result of the fall of man. And uh, because men, in terms of humoral theory, are seen as being very hot and dry, their sexuality is imagined as being quite hot and dry. And so if there's no acceptable sexual outlet for men because they're not married, there is this idea that they're going to have to have, like, they're going to have to basically get their rocks off or they will become violent, mm. is the idea. And so they're like, you don't want a bunch of violent men uh, sitting around in your city because they'll murder each other, like, there will be riots you know, it, like it will, all, everything will go crazy. Hmm. Um, so, 
the reaction to this is then, okay, so we will have brothels and mm. we will have sex work, which is legal. Um, and it's it's nobody's favorite thing. No one is all like, oh, this is a great thing. Absolutely love the, the brothel. That's fantastic. Mm. But it's considered necessary. And it's uh, so basically the thing is with that as well. They kind of feel as though being a sex worker is just kind of like one of those things that some women do. And it's not like this be all end all thing, you know, so you can do it for a while as a job. And then if you're sick of it, the, what you do is you go to the priest and you say, oh, yeah, I'm sick of this. Like, bless me, father, I've sinned. I've been on the game. And they'll say, OK, well, your penance is to go get married. And, uh, you know, if you go get married and start a family, then fine. Um, sometimes, especially in the later medieval period, there will also be dedicated uh, kind of nunneries and things for people who have been in sex work um and like there's orders like the magdalens for example in the german lands are like expressly for ex-sex workers but then sometimes like in southern france for example they'll just kind of like almost set up institutions that are like a retirement home mm -hmm. and like everyone in a brothel will just go retire there and it's just like okay we're done now <laughs> and it's kind mm -hmm. of like semi-religious but not really um so they're, they really think about it differently to us, where we're like, oh, if you ever, ever were a sex worker, then your whole life is ruined. And you're yeah. just, oh, this fallen woman. And oh, God, oh, what, what a terrible thing that happened to you. And medieval people are like, I don't know, it's a job. Yeah. All right. You know, like, and it's it, granted, and, you know, as I say, they're not like, oh, no one's going like, oh, I really hope my my daughter works in the brothel. Mm. Like, that's not what it is. But it is especially so say you're some peasant girl and you don't want to live down on the farm mm. and you show up in a city, you manage to run away and you show up in a city. That is incredibly well paid work that you can do right now. Mm. And we know that you can make a lot of money off of it. Because, um, so well, in a, in a lot of ways, but like, so for example, the preacher that I worked on when he starts his weird little community uh, for preachers and ex sex workers, he does it in like a big old house that was owned by a former madam. So she was making tons of money, like scads of money. And then she's like, oh, I've seen the error of my ways, please. I'm giving I'm giving you like this, this house and all this money. Um, but also you see it in the examples of the so-called prostitute saints who are uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, the Afra of Augsburg and uh, Catherine of Egypt, I think. And um, they, the, you know, their legends are always like they were incredibly rich. They made so much money uh, and they, you know, had all these beautiful clothes, but then they give it all up because they love Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of shows you that this is this way of making money that is really possible for a lot of women. And, you know, there's um, the, this is something that is written about really extensively. So St. Augustine writes about how this has to be permissible. Um, same thing with Thomas Aquinas. Um, he writes about it and says that it needs to be permissible. And, you know, here in London, where I am, the largest number of brothels are in Southwark because usually... Um, Usually it's uh, said that brothels can't be in the middle of a city. They either need to be up next to or outside of the city walls. So here in London, most of them are kind of like across the river. Um, and all that land was owned by the Bishop of Winchester. So the Bishop of Winchester is just like making all of his money <laughs> running to brothels. Right. So uh, to the point where one of the slang terms in the kind of late medieval and early medieval period. Yeah, right? Right? You <laughs> call them, they call these women in the late medieval and early modern periods Winchester geese. That's like mm. one of the slang terms for sex worker. So it's quite different, right? Um, it, it's just a really, really different way of looking at sexuality and looking at um, at women and, and how these things might work out. Hmm. Um, there was, they talked about homosexuality in... Mm in the medieval era, but just as you know, in the Roman Empire, it was common to take a younger lover, and it was common to have a partner, you know, Hadrian was gay, and even Trajan was told was gay, I believe, and he had a younger lover, he did lover as well, and Hadrian, you know, you have Hadrian a local, of course, mm -hmm. but in the medieval era, it was, was not okay to be, be a homosexual or lesbian in any way or form, right? Yeah, so it, it it's one of these things that's kind of interesting because you you know they don't have a concept of being mm -hmm. homosexual. Um, for medieval people, you know, is sexuality isn't like a defining term. You're defined by your actions, mm -hmm. right? And so your actions are if you is are you a sodomite or not, mm 
-hmm. right? And sodomy, again, is defined as any type of sex where you can't get pregnant. And obviously, to people who are of the same sex, you know, they're, they're having sex, they're, they're not going to be able to get pregnant. So you're definitely doing sodomy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when we talk about sodomy, that could just be like oral sex. It can be man and be all, like I, I, that. And they take a dick. This is something that can kind of change over time. So um, sometimes you'll see, especially in the earlier medieval period, people are more down on it. And um, I think this is kind of seen as sort of like a way of proving your Christianity. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, we're, we're really into cracking down on, on gay people or whatever. Mm. And then at other times, it's it's much more of a free for all. Like you see over and over and over again um, in uh, the in non nunneries and monasteries people are having sex with each other all the time nuns are having sex monasteries are having sex and there was these constant crackdowns where they're like guys you got to knock it off just mm. stop and you'll see like these sets of rules come in uh, in nunneries and they'll be like do not sleep naked in other nuns beds stop it right now don't you mm. dare call each other my dear or my little bird stop it stop mm. it you know and like over and over again monks are told to stop it or priests are told to stop it it's like a, a really specific issue within the church you know because people are just living in communities together and mm. you know that there, there it is um and so we know that people are doing gay stuff <laughs> <laughs> all the time um because but it, it also is one of these things where very interestingly it's you know it's seen as bad and it's kind of like knock it off don't do that but it kind of we see a shift in the late medieval period and then in the early modern period where stuff gets much more homophobic mm. And this starts more expressly in the Italian city states, ironically, because, you know, the Renaissance was notedly very gay. Uh, I think we can all agree. But at the same time, um, it, in the Italian city states, there starts to be this big crackdown on men having sex with each other. Um, and so, for example, they, they will establish like sodomy police who basically just go around looking to bust men for having sex with each mm -hmm. other. Um, but even then, when they find men having sex with each other, then this is kind of documented. Um, you know, the first time you get caught, it's sort of like, okay, you're fined, I don't know, five lira. And then if you're caught a second time, it goes up to 10. And a third time, or it, it's 20. Fourth time. And then kind of like on the sixth time, I think it is, they'll 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 kill you, mm. uh, which is obviously awful. But kind of what they're showing with this kind of repeated finding is like you need to knock it off in terms of people being able to see this mm. it's kind of like you need to keep it down everybody knows you're doing gay stuff don't let us see that um and then also it can be kind of confusing because if you're looking at medieval documents you'll see all the time that people see well not all the time but at times you'll see people who are executed for sodomy uh, if you just assume sodomy is gay sex then sure a lot of time if you go look into it and you see that somebody was executed you'll find out it'll be like a guy who raped an eight-year-old mm -hmm. and they're like no that's it like and they don't have a word for pedophilia you know they don't have a word for the it, it just form of sodomy and so there are obvious gradations within it as well but the thing about homosexuality and why it's considered bad is because sex is bad and so the only reason you're supposed to be having sex is to get pregnant. If you can't get pregnant, then it's definitely bad that you're having sex, mm. right? Um, so it, it's all kind of part and parcel with this rejection of sexuality for anything other than procreation. Was you mentioned monasteries and in in monasteries and nunneries, was there ever oh, sexual frustrations there, like homosexuality in the monasteries or in oh god yes oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> much um you know and we we have lots of like love poetry that's left over from the like because uh, nuns and monks are usually literate and can and can mm -hmm. write and you know that's their job so we'll have like love letters and love poems that they send each other back and forth talking about having sex all the time mm -hmm. um so okay now i've got to hold on oh yeah <laughs> sure sorry i need to deal with i just don't take a break on the so, yeah yeah we just had to take a little break there but yeah let's continue about <laughs> monasteries and sexuality there yeah, so it's it's quite interesting because you, you know sometimes we'll see, for example, what one of the reasons we'll find love letters is because um people will have been found to be having an affair and then they'll kind of move one or the other people to another monastery or another nunnery in order to stop it, and we certainly also see it in the case of um calls to crack down, 
mm. on on you know sodomy they'll say okay well we're 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 having a big reform and everybody has to stop doing this now so um you know uh, it's estimated like maybe maybe kind of like one in 10 people is is up to is up to and i actually got that statistic from a colleague of mine talking about it on twitter and saying now people are always talking about uh, you know the the clergy in, in, engaging in sexual sins but it, it's you know really it, it, that's been over egged because it's not more than one in ten people and I'm like I don't know ten percent <laughs> when mm -hmm. when you're supposed to be religious seems pretty high to me you know mm. I mean like you said also there's the sexual relations between men as well in monasteries or women in nunneries as well or was that how how easy was it to hide if you if you know, if you did have sexual it's, relations yeah, with both. a man. Uh, you know, it can be, it can be pretty easy to hide it. You know, if you're just careful. You know, I think mm. that there's a lot of people who definitely get away with it. But it, it tends to be that you get found out in at times when people are just being really relaxed about it. Mm. And so we tend to find out because it's got so far that you know people are just kind of like openly sleeping in each other's beds and things, mm. and no one kind of thinks anything of it. And that's when you'll have a big reform, and that's when you'll have a big crackdown. They'll be like, okay, we can't. You you need. It's this plausible deniability thing. Right. So it's kind of the same as the sodomy police. Same thing within monasteries and nunneries where it's just you need to be discreet is, is kind of the, the the desired thing here. But um, we know that, you know, people are oftentimes, especially it'll be a big thing for younger men and their masters in monasteries. So, you know, they'll have a crush on their teacher. And they'll have a relationship with their teacher. So, you know, quite similar to what we kind of see um, in the classical period as well, but just in a monastic context instead. Um, and then, yeah, it's pretty big for nuns and um, a lot of the time ecstatic visions of Christ and things like that, that women, right, will involve kind of like big orgies with their whole nunnery and Jesus. You know, things, mm. things like that. So, yeah. you know, it gets, it's it's pretty queer is, is at, at the very least, I would say. Mm. The one last thing I want to talk about before we end this podcast is child marriages and marriages, and it was quite common in royalty at the time. You know, in the late medieval era, you have Henry the Fifth's sister being married off to Prince, I believe, Eric of Denmark, or the Childmore mm -hmm. Union at the time. He was eleven, and he was eighteen, mm -hmm. twenty, I think, at the time. But when it came to these child marriages, so that where you be married at age of twelve or thirteen or even younger, mm -hmm. younger perhaps. How, when did sexual relations start? Yeah, uh, the th Much later is the answer. So um, it's, it's pretty common that, you know, you, you'll get what will happen with, with these, right? Right. So you, what, what happens is that um, you get married. Um, mm. but, but by that you just have the religious ceremony. So you go to church and you get married as an 11 year old or as an eight year old. And then usually the wait time then is till you're 16. Mm. Um, and that, and then at 16, then there will be kind of like a betting ceremony and then they will have sex. Mm. Um, that is still young in terms of the average yeah. age for everything in the medieval period. The average age of marriage for medieval people is 20. Mm. Um, you know, they, they get married in their early 20s as a general rule of thumb. But you are royal. Obviously, you have a whole different life, you know, and your your sex life is is about, you know, creating heirs and creating uh, contracts. So it is young, but it is it, it, it's definitely one of these things where you are waiting. You're waiting till 16. Um, sometimes they can go as low as 14 in the case of girls, but it's frowned upon. Mm. It's frowned upon. Uh, so it, it's kind of 16 is the generally regarded time when it's all right because so just like um achieving menarche and like starting your period that's not considered good enough <laughs> a lot of the time they're like yeah okay well that's one i think 16 16 should be fine and you know part of the, that also is while you'll have the marriages and stuff sometimes you know a better offer will come up and they'll be like mm -hmm. never mind break that off and you know the girl gets sent mm -hmm. home and then you know she gets married off to someone else he gets married off to someone else so it is kind of a way of establishing connections, but basically, it's possible to do so. 
I mean, you do have Anna Tomnani in the Byzantine Empire. I believe she was betrothed when she was even wasn't even born yet to someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 and it's it's really crazy um, how how medieval monarchs live, you know. And it, it, the thing that I always say about it is, you know, these are definitely true things and true things that happen. But we have to also keep in mind how few people monarchs actually are you know they're kind of like point zero 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 one percent of the population yeah. but we just know everything about them right we mm. know everything about monarchs because they're the rich people and so that's what things are written down so this is not how most people are living it's not how most people conduct marriages mm. and even then you know it's not like oh yeah go have sex with this eight-year-old now <laughs> like that, mm. that would not that would not be considered uh, acceptable you know mm. i mean i i don't know bringing this up and and as, I don't know if you've seen House of the Dragons, although it's fantasy. Mm -hmm. It is. I, I thought I thought it depicted the picture to draw in medieval politics and such, even sexuality within the show of the medieval era rather nicely. You know, you do have the scene where this, I, I don't remember, it's Viserys the second is going to marry this, talking about marrying this kid. I don't remember the family's name. But how at the thought mm -hmm. about this, that she, they say she, she, he didn't have to have a sexual rela relation with her until she grew up. And I, th I thought they, mm, they mm. the show depicted it rather nicely, both in medieval politics and medieval sexuality and medieval era in general, although it's fiction, of course. Yeah, I, that, that's something that I really enjoy about it. And I really liked um, in House of the Dragon as well. You know, for example, the whole thing when... Um, you know, when she gets married and, uh, you know, her husband's gay and she's like, well, that's mm. fine, whatever, you know, like we're, we're yeah. going to get married and, and we're going to have a family and, you know, you do what you're going to do and I'll do what I'm going to do yeah. and we'll just, we'll make it work. Right. Um, and I think that was quite good in terms of how these things really kind of worked out. You know, there is this understanding most of the time that you're, you're not going to be in love with your spouse. And so you will establish mm. these other things, but it is, and, and I think they did a good job there also of being like oh yeah and then the problem is is it becomes too obvious right mm -hmm. so um you know it, it is about kind of balancing these demands mm -hmm. really and it's really on this show where you ship incest i know i know it's really <laughs> close, and you're like oh you're like oh that's gross she finally got together with her <laughs> uncle isn't that nice they're like oh it's like they, they will they'll really they'll really fool you in, yeah. in <laughs> you know Thank you so much for coming on. I think you're going to round it up there. And uh, of course, before you go, do you have any social media you want to share? Anything else you want me to put in the description? And where can people find your book? Oh, yeah, you can find it wherever uh, good books are sold. I also know if you don't want to read it in English, it's coming out in German in October. Ooh. Um, and sometime, I think early next year in Chinese, which is exciting. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you can get it, uh, you can get it, uh, pretty much, um, anywhere you usually get books. And the thing that I'm asking people to do is if you have bought it, if you could review it online, if you like it, that really helps apparently. Hmm. Mm. And, uh, of course you have on social media, you want to add me on the blog, you have a blog, you know, that you, yeah, love, my blog. yeah, I'm um, uh, going hyphen medieval.com is there. I I just wrote something this week about uh, tapestries and sexuality and what we can kind of learn about the upper classes from that. Um, and um, I am on Twitter at Going Medieval, and I'm just kind of dicking around there. So come by, say hi. Absolutely, follow. <laughs> we are also available on Twitter under Web that H well. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts. If you are an Apple podcast, please consider writing a review. That would help us out a lot. Also, check out our other episode on misconceptions about the medieval era or other episodes of the podcast as well. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.